Uh, so good evening. Um, thank you all for coming on this uh, miserable night, although I think it turned out okay now. Um, unfortunately, uh, Malgo Duverger, who has put a lot of work into organizing this event, and actually I think wrote the beautiful introduction, is not here. She had an emergency in Poland, but I wanted to thank her. Um, for organizing, and thank you for Julie Kaplan for introducing and for taking over the organizing. Mm -hmm. Thank you also to Vince Boudreau, president of CCNY, and Didi uh, Mazelewski, his assistant, or his deputy, rather, uh, for co-sponsoring this event and really for embracing the book from the beginning. And to the Rifkin Center, which technically I direct, but um, in this case, is supporting me <laughs> as, on, as an author. Um, and of course, Natalia Alexion, who I think flew in from where? Germany, Poland, uh, um, and um, just now. And I'm so grateful for her as an interlocutor. So um, I've already been done like maybe six of these talks, but this is the one that I'm most, I guess, excited, nervous, happy about because my friends are here and my colleagues and um, my mother and stepfather who flew in from Israel and another family friend who flew in from Israel. Um, so <laughs> 12, hour fli 12 hour flight to hear me. Uh, so I'm so I'm so grateful for that. Um, we also have a a great Iranian author in the room, uh, Ali Morad, who uh, is the, the Samuel Beckett of Iran. Um, so really, um, it's wonderful to be in the company of my friends and my students and my colleagues and so on. Now, many of you have, I think, walked me through the journey or been with me on this journey of writing this book seemingly forever. And um, many times during this forever, it seemed like it wouldn't even end, but somehow it did end. And, um, and, the, and it's just fabulous to, to celebrate the fruit of this very long journey uh, with you. I want to particularly acknowledge four people and, and entities, if you will. The first one is uh, Salar Abda, who um, my conversations with him are started this book, and I'll talk a little bit about how in a minute. Uh, and he also accompanied this book and researched in Iran, where as an Israeli citizen, I couldn't go. So that's the first person. Secondly, Elaine Mason, who couldn't be here. She's my editor at WW Norton. And um, Elaine, from the first day she read the proposal until the last footnote that she made me double check 1,000 times is really, um, was just a wonderful editor. I don't think my book, my book would have had the information that it has without her, but it wouldn't have become this kind of shiny object that it became without her steadfast editing and through multiple drafts. Um, thirdly, City College, the National Endowment for the Arts, Lady Davies Foundations, basically all foundations that supported my research and gave me, and gave me money to do the travel, to do the writing, and without that, I couldn't do this work. And this humanities research takes a long time some stories like this take a long time to research and, and uh, uncover. And I was grateful to have benefited from that, and I hope they continue benefiting others in the future. Um, finally, I want to acknowledge my son, Daniel, who um, with kind of makes everything make sense um, and makes me feel competent enough to, to travel across continents and, um, and do research. So a few words about the book, and then, uh, then we'll do a conversation. So 10 years ago, I set out to write a book about a man uh, whom, with whom I grew up, who I saw every day and night and weekends for the first 18 years of my life, but about whom, and especially about whose past, I knew virtually nothing, my father. I knew more or less three things. I knew that he was born in a Polish town called Ostromazowiecka. I knew that he traveled to Israel through Iran during the war with a group called the Tehran children. I did not think of my father, nor did he present himself as a Holocaust survivor. 
he was one of the lucky ones. He was not a survivor as far as I'm concerned, I was concerned, and as far as he was concerned, he was a Tehran child. In 1993, my father died, and shortly after I came to the United States, and I studied here, I got my PhD, I became a professor at City College, and I had not pursued, I had not really pursued any writing or thinking about my family until this conversation, conversation in 2007 with Salar, uh, um, so Salar asked me if I knew anything about Jewish refugees in Tehran during the war. He had read an article about it in an Iranian paper, and I said, well, my father was one. And um, of course, he was stunned, but um, when he asked me how my father got there, who brought him there, what's the story, I couldn't really say much more. And those questions led to what is now this book. Um, but the book that I ended up writing ended up being not just about my father or, and also not just about these 1,000 or so children who came to Mandatory Palestine through Iran. It really became a book about most Polish Jewish survivors. And it's very hard to, to grasp this, but um, the fact is that most Polish Jewish survivors, people who were alive in 1945, survived the war in the Soviet interior, in Central Asia, in Iran, in India, in Mandatory Palestine, in Lebanon, in Syria, and elsewhere. And this is a very hard thing to grasp, that this is most of the survivors. And yet, these survivors, who are the majority of Polish Jewish um, re residents who escaped Nazi extermination, have never been recognized as survivors. Uh, in 1952, there was a reparation agreement between Israel and Germany. They were not part of that. Um, they were not, despite intense scholarly and popular attention, that's changing now, of course, with the work of Atina Grossman and other people, but they have not been researched very much, and they've definitely been not been commemorated. I've actually never been with my father in a kind of Holocaust commemoration, per se. And when... So and when there is no master narrative of a story, as there is, for example, of, of uh, when we think about Auschwitz, we have Primo Levi, we have Art Spiegelman, we know the story, even if we don't know, even if your parent doesn't tell you anything, you know the story. Here, there was no story, and because there was no story, each survivor and each child of survivor like me experienced their fate alone as if it was only their story. Um, this book has been out for less than a month. I've been getting tons of emails from people whose parents were in Central Asia. Three people so far came to my talks who had Polish Jewish mothers who married Iranian men who ended up in Iran, and one of them was actually born in Iran. Um, one man wrote me that he thought only his mom was in Iran. He didn't realize that there were other people, because again, if there is no story, then how do you know exactly who was there and who was not? So my book became the story. My, my book became, or I hope, became the historical form, framework through which people can understand their story or their relative story as uh, the story of the Holocaust survivors of the East. And at the same time, my book, I hope, remains a very intimate memoir. I mean, you could say that it is a second-generation memoir of a daughter whose father had the symptoms of, of a survivor without the story of the survivor, and I wrote that story. The book also tells the story of my own life as I travel to work and unear to unearth my father's and other refugees' stories. And as such, it's not just a book about the past, but it's a book about the present. A very political book because it deals with, among other things, how this story is remembered in contemporary Poland, Russia, Uzbekistan, Iran, Israel. How I interrogate how I, as an Israeli-born academic, understand this story, right? Because we have to remember that this is not a story that can just be dug through eight, eight decades of um, communism and um, so Polish revisionism and Zionist ideology and American liberalism, you sort of have to work a little bit like an archaeologist to sift through all these 
lenses and all these historic, these, these, um, these ideologies through which that shape the ways we understand the past. And I, that's one of the things that I try to do. One of the most exciting things for me and moving things that I had in each place that I went to, starting with really with Salar, I had somebody helping me with my research. Because it's not like you can just travel to Uzbekistan and just say, hey, I'm going to, I want to see the KGB archives from 1942. Uh, you need to have some in. And in fact, you in Uzbekistan, I didn't even travel as a, an independent researcher. I traveled as a tourist of the Silk Road. And um, I had somebody helping me on the side, and a research assistant. So. In many, many instances, in all of these instances, I had a host or, or a helper or an assistant. And in most of the times, these were not Jewish people. And I think, you know, we are in the center of a Jewish history here. And we know that Jewish history is a heavy burden to carry, which is why people like me stayed away from it for a long time. And we would like other people to help us carry this, this, this burden. And, and that it was really wonderful to receive this help. At the same time, we, when, you, when somebody helps you with your project, they too have their own histories. They too have their own traumas of exile, of, of uh, their families being deported, of being refugees uh, in, uh, from the Islamic Revolution. Um, and when you're in dialogue, then you have these histories that are parallel and speak to each other, but also can clash, right? I mean, Iranian history and Israeli history today, Polish Christian, Polish Jewish history in the past. Um, so my book is not kind of this kind of we are the world sappy kind of book, but it tries to really offer a complex vision of the past and the present, uh, a vision where dialogue is can be difficult, but also dialogue is possible. And maybe I'll stop here and I'll say more in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michal. And I feel like uh, it's a wonderful opening to a conversation that I was very much looking forward to. And I want to come back to some of the points that you made and push you on those points and maybe give you a little more chance to, to, to talk about it. So you, you mentioned that this book, and I think it's its great strength, is both intensely personal, intimate, and, and then there is wealth of research, footnotes, uh, documents in uh, all kinds of languages uh, from uh, many, many countries. Some of them found their way to you almost as a way of miracle. Uh, but I was wondering how today, after this journey, uh, personal journey, intellectual journey, a geographic journey, uh, how you look at your project, which is so many things at the same time, right? In terms of discipline, in terms of uh, frameworks of Holocaust history, Second World War history, history of forced migrations, U uh, USSR, um, uh, politics, history. Uh, so how today you look at that a story being told through more than one uh, national framework? And I'll then push you on some specific national framework. Right. So I, I, well, you, you know that I was born and raised in Israel. and. Uh, can you hear me? Um, and you know, one of the I think mostly one of the gifts, or, and, and but also the complications of being born and raised in Israel, in my generation anyway, was that you grew up pretty much without a diasporic past. You grew up Israel was is it was a new beginning, right? And whatever happened before the war, but also the pre-war past, um, was it was erased. I was to be the first generation of, uh, of people who grew up without the burden of this, of this suffering, without um, the burden of having been, in a way, ejected from Europe. You know, we now have our own country, and um, this, uh, this will be the new generation of, of, um, 
of new people. Even the generation of my father, and he himself, I think, turned his back to this past. Right? Uh, and it was a coping mechanism and not a bad one, I think. But when I started excavating, I'm like, wow, you know, I'm like, there is so much past. There is so much, um, there is such a journey, the journey that my father took. And let me show you, if you look at this map, this is where they started. So this is Ostrom Zovietchka, and it goes all the way up in here, Achangelsk, and then all the way down here through Central Asia, Iran, India, Yemen, Egypt, and into mandatory Palestine. This is, this is half the world, and we're talking about two children. Let's see if I can go back. This is my father and his sister, Regina, and their parents, Hannah and Zinda. These are children who she never left ho their hometown before. He left town once for a tensilectomy in Warsaw, which is 60 miles away, and they crossed half the world and saw so many things, so it's a journey. But also, I, after I started researching, I realized that my family was in, had been lived in Poland for eight generations, eight. I mean, we were in Israel one generation. I'm already here. Um, so it was sort of a momentous, a momentous history, um, as well as a history of the embeddedness of my family and of Jews in the, in the non-Jewish world, right, in, in Poland, in, these, in Iran, in Uzbekistan, which, again, I had the gift of growing up in a, in a country where I was mostly surrounded by, by Jews, and I was kind of like a wasp of that country. And um, so um, it's a gift, but it's also li limiting. And so my world became, became much, much larger. mentioned this expanding lands and actually in a book you 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 said now that they were ejected and in a book you you made this uh, statement even stronger you at some point you talk about them being vomited out uh, which i thought was uh, incredible but uh, but i want to go back to that um israeli um narrative of what is the normative Holocaust experience, right? You, you mentioned that, that you lacked that story to attach your own family experience and your father's story to other stories and have a, a, a text to it or some visual uh, of it. So I wonder, um, what do you think about um, expanding? expanding what we understand as Holocaust experience to include um, hundreds of thousands of uh, the, lucky, the lucky Polish and other uh, Jews that survived in the Soviet Union. I mean, obviously I think they should be included. I'm not even sure, I'm not entirely sure, and I, I'm gonna, I'm, I am in the process of researching this maybe for an article, why they were originally not included in the reparations agreements and so on. And my hunch is, is that because so many other people were deported by the Soviets, there's probably this thought, okay, this, so, this is gonna be, Too this much. is gonna open, yeah, it's gonna open, uh, not only for Jews, but for non-Jews. Um, but um, I certainly do think that, and I'm not the only one who thinks that, uh, that we need to start thinking about Holocaust history in a more global, bring other players into the picture. For example, British, the British government, in many, so in this story, many, most of the Jews who survived in the way that I'm describing survived in Central Asia. They all wanted to leave, they all wanted, only a minority of, of them ended up in Iran and then in India and other places. But they all wanted to be evacuated. One of the reasons why they weren't evacuated, I mean, it was, there were multiple reasons and multiple people who prevented them from being evacuated, well, one of the players are, are the, is the British government who didn't want, thought, well, they're gonna be evacuated and they're gonna go to Iran and then from there they'll continue to Palestine 
and we already have a, a Jewish um, Arab problem, and we're going to have hundreds of thousands of people coming, Jews coming to Palestine. Let's just kind of leave them in the Soviet Union. But of course, leaving them in the Soviet Union meant a death sentence for many of them. This, this Central Asia in 1942 was um, a place of extreme starvation because basically the Uzbek and Kazakh and Turkmeni uh, farmers were feeding the Red Army while they, their food was confiscated. And of course, the refugees are at the bottom of the food chain. So, um, you know, this was not just, I mean, they had their own political motivation, but this was also a death sentence to a lot of people. Uh, so thinking about the whole, I mean, in terms of research, I think it's high time we think about these these refugees and the story more globally and in terms of including these refugees, I think as you saw in my book, and I think many people don't, didn't really understand how much suffering these people went through. I mean, this is really, yes, they were lucky, but they were only lucky in the sense that they did not die. Other than that, they were not lucky. Um, they went through, through tremendous suffering. They, um, they, they were, um, many, many deaths by starvation. I mean, the Soviets assess, I think, 25% in the settlements alone. And, um, and I think, you know, I mean, I think uh, recognizing what they went through and giving it a place and commemorating it is very, very important. Because it, it, people really, um, they were just expected to just go about their lives in Israel, but also elsewhere, right? I mean, people stayed in all of these other places. And So your father, you mentioned it in that book, and you mentioned it today, it, your father would not think of himself as a Holocaust survivor. You know, we, he had friends who had tattoos on their arm. They were the survivors, mm -hmm. right? Um, also, these children, in te the Tehran children, were brought to Israel as, or to what was Palestine as children, Many of them were raised in kibbutzim. Many of them became military people. My father was in the Israeli Air Force. Not necessarily because they were so gun ho to build the military, but they, that was one of the only paths open to them, uh, career paths, because they, they didn't, oftentimes didn't go to university and, and have a, a long time to, to have a career. I mean, they were alone and they were child refugees. Um, so I think, but I think at the same time, they, in Israel, they, fa they were told, you know, you're now Israeli, right? You're brought, this is your home, you're Israeli, you're going to grow up in a kibbutz, and they, became, they did become Israeli. So your place is your fate, right? Your place is your fate. You ended up in Israel, maybe you weren't from a Zionist family at all, but you ended up, in fact, one of the most wonderful sources that I had was a travel diary of a Jewish boy from Warsaw, Emil Landau, who um, came from a very assimilated uh, Polish Jewish family and he wrote a diary. Kid was like, I don't understand how he could know so much at 14. He drew maps, he knew the geography, he knew about languages. He was a beautiful writer. So I got his, uh, his uh, travel diary and he was really able to, to teach me a lot because it was written then. In what um, language? In Polish. Mm -hmm. It was written in Polish, and I had it translated. Emi Landau, who really grew up in a completely assimilated family, ended up growing in Kibbutz Ganigal. He ended up um, in 1947, the War of Independence starts, and he ends up basically killed in the war in a way he does this basically this heroic act. He, there, is, um, there are trucks with weapons coming from Lebanon to the battles of Haifa. He jumps on a truck. He basically blows the truck up so those weapons won't get to Haifa. And he is, in fact, the first recipient of the Medal of Honor, of the highest Medal of Honor from the Israeli government in 48. Now, the fact that he ended up in, in, in Palestine on some level is completely arbitrary. He could have many things could have happened, but that's, that, was, that was his fate. I want to go back to the arbitrarium in a moment, but um, I want to return to where the story on the map, at least not in a book, mm -hmm. um, because the book tells your journey, 
uh, but to Ostrov Mazowiecka. And uh, you introduce Poland in an extremely interesting way as a place that was completely unfamiliar. Uh, you write of it as a wound, as an inheritance, and, and a wound at the same time, a place you meet. And in fact, I think we met for the first time in Warsaw. Um, so I wonder what you think about uh, the role of Poland as as a birthplace of, of your father to that story, to his story and the story of other lucky survivors that just to cite the title of, of book co-edited by Athena Grossman were sheltered from the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. Oh, that's a very <laughs> loaded question. Um, but uh, yeah, so I grew up, uh, again, growing up in Israel, Poland for me was this sort of mythical place that really didn't really exist as a place, just was just like kind of my father's mythical prehistory. Um, the first time I landed in Poland, I was, you know, it's only like, you know, it's four hour flight, right, from, from Israel and you land there and uh, people have uh, lives no and difference. their kids, you know, play Legos and um, you're like, oh my, it's a, it's a real place um, because it was so, it was so it was so loaded for me, um, and as I said, um, I was able so I was able to know quite a bit about my father's life in Poland. Partly because um, there is one, there is basically a, a descendant of Ostrom um residents who is a lawyer in in um, Canada who has been collecting materials from the day he could from the early '90s. So I could have a within. A day of writing him, I had a whole family tree tracing back the first member of my family to 1789, and that person's name was Michael, so my namesake, whom I didn't know, right? Um, and then I was able to, and you know this, uh, I was able to go, so first time I went to Poland, um, in what I call trauma tourism, where you go and you see everything that's been ruined and everything, that, and then the second time I was invited by a Polish historian who hails from my father's hometown, and that was a much more interesting and complex, complex uh, visit because um, the historian basically is now the deputy minister of culture of the Polish government, of the current Polish government. I, I didn't know that at the time when I was, this was, in, she, in fact, she wasn't that at the time. So I ended up very much being thrown into the Polish narrative, if you will and the, all the Polish Christian narrative. Uh, so I think um, at the end, to, to answer your question more specifically, and we can talk about maybe later in another question, I do see Poland is very much a key to understanding my father. There were little things. My father, for example, was obsessed with um, mushroom hunting. Now, you know, you live in Israel, it's not that there are that many mushrooms to hunt, <laughs> but uh, there are, you know, there are, Haifa is hilly, but the minute it would rain a little bit, we'd be like up there hunt, hunting for mushrooms, and I was like, well, you know, and that was, he was so happy in those moments, and I, now, I didn't understand, then I realized that they would go every Saturday, they would go mushroom hunting every Saturday in Poland. So there were so many little things like that were sort of clues into who my father was, and when I was in Poland, so many people reminded me of him and how he acted. So it's, I feel like it's, Poland for me is both uh, intimacy and heartbreak at the same time. I think it's also one more way in which your book expands uh, thinking about the Holocaust experience or World War II experience because it shows that there is a pre-Holocaust, right? There is a childhood, there is a youth lived before, like that amazing picture on the street of Ostrov. Mazowiecka and you need that picture to understand the destruction and the hardship that happens later. Um, you mentioned the, the politics of today and how much your book is also rooted in the contemporary challenges. Um, and since we talk uh, uh, in the neighborhood coffee place, uh, uh, you mentioned that the response that you get from people who find real book framework to their parents' experience. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about some of the political tensions that are beginning to show up in your feed. 
Yeah. So I wrote a book. Basically, I wrote a book about Israel, Iran, and Poland. Right? Could you be Simple. more? You know, could you swim in more sensitive water? And my book is political, so it doesn't avoid these questions. It tackles these questions, and I immediately. Um, so since the book came out, I've been getting a lot of hate mail from polls, from nationalist polls, um, who haven't read the book. Because in fact, as you already heard, I actually talk quite a bit about Christian polls. I don't just think about Jewish history in this very isolated way. Um, but uh, I mean, just a week ago, I published a piece in um, Foreign Policy magazine. And the piece was, was the headline was, uh, Jewish and Christian Polish refugees were welcomed in Iran. And it was basically about Iran and the experience of these refugees in Iran. Immediately, I started getting these, this hate mail that's like, you know, this, this has nothing to do with Iran. Why didn't you acknowledge the General Anders who took you Jews out of the Soviet Union and to Iran? Um, so I'm getting that. I'm also getting support messages from Poles. I'm getting a lot of. Um, love mail messages from Iranians. Um, but, but those messages, too, sometimes they're a little bit like the people who write, uh, you have proven that Iran is good and Saudi Arabia is bad. Um, <laughs> and um, I don't, you know, needless to say, I don't really write about Saudi Arabia, even though I think uh, Iran it, it does, um, I think, did welcome the refugees, and I think they, they, those experiences were very moving. Um, I'm getting some messages, I don't know from whom people are saying, you belong in Israel, go back to Israel. Um, so um, in the beginning, I was a little bit intimidated, but then people convinced me that it's, it means it's a good thing, it means that my book is, is getting to people and people <laughs> are, care about it. But, um, uh, but I think, yes, I mean, we are in the middle of, um, I mean, we know that there is an active effort on behalf of, of the Polish government to engage in historical revisionism, right? Um, we know that actually each one of these players wants their narrative to be, the to dominate, dominate yeah. right? Um, and so uh, I'm trying to, um, I don't know, to stay independent as much as I can. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a little bit complicated. I mean, we talked about the role of, in, of the intellectual today in this, in this space. And it's a very complicated, I mean, I, I would say, okay, you need to stay independent. But what does that mean exactly, right? I mean, for example, I'll give you an example um, that we talked about. So some historians who are in the Israeli left are very upset what, what they feel is uh, the Israeli government's uh, usurpation of Holocaust memory in order to justify its policies, right? So then they end up saying, they end up sort of, because they want to kind of stick it to the Israeli government, they're saying, um, look, you know, not only Jews suffered, we have to acknowledge Polish suffering and blah, blah, blah. So in kind of wanting to stick it to the Israeli government, they end up being in bed with the Polish government which, you know, so what did you do here? You know, you, you're, then you end up supporting this other narrative, which is probably worse. Um, so staying, I think, staying independent, but also understanding the global politics of this, not just kind of your own national politics, is, uh, is, very, is very challenging. But I, I also will say, apropos these politics, that I, I think my role as an intellectual, and what I try to do in the book is to be as open as possible. To really be as open, which means that you try to be in dialogue even when it's really hard, and even you try to be with dialogue with whoever you can be in dialogue with. Some people you just can't be in dialogue with, right? I mean, people have been writing me, uh, I mean, I actually try to engage with some people on Twitter, and you know, sometimes it doesn't go so well, and they just, you feel like they just, they just don't listen. If they're even people and not robots, I'm not sure. But um, uh, to the degree that you can, and you should, and also you should in a way of what I think what you need to do is acknowledge that sometimes even those very obnoxious people who are revising come from their, uh, really, from their own wounds. I mean, these are real wounds, right? Um, they're real wounds that maybe are politically manipulated. 
but they're real wounds. So if, to the degree that you can, as, as an intellectual, I think you have to keep those in mind and then decide who you can engage with and who you absolutely can't. I must say that I've seen some of Michal's exchanges on Twitter and she's incredibly um, patient uh, <laughs> in, uh, in engaging. And I think it, it also uh, comes across the book. I, I thought that you mentioned earlier um, that the portrayal of your guides and research assistants, that it's a series of fascinating encounters um, for us as well to follow. Um, but I want to um, go back before maybe we share the mic with, uh, with the audience um, to go back to the question of agency and those uh, decisions you cite the anecdote that your father did tell about the brothers, one made a um, bad right decision and the other one uh, right bad decision. Um, what's your reading after tracing the journey uh, like this of the degree to which individual strategies of surviving, whether in uh, uh, Arhangelsk or on the way to uh, Tehran, to what extent they mattered? I mean, I think it definitely in the story of the Soviet Union, I mean, it's a story of suffering, but it, it is a story, I think, where there is more agency to to the, to the victims. Um, people did make decisions. Um, people did have their own personal personalities that changed. I mean, my, my in, on my father's journey, it was my father, his sister, and a younger cousin. The, young, the younger cousin actually was completely orphaned uh, because she was, uh, basically, she was summering with the family in, in the summer of 1939. And when they fled, she fled with them while her parents stayed in Warsaw. And, of course, her family perished. She was very, and still is, she's alive, very charming, very extremely well-educated, extremely well-mannered. And wherever she was, she managed to get some adult who would take care of her and she would sort of have like a slightly better fate. So for in, in Tehran, when the children were in a, in a tent camp, some adult took her to like a house um, and so on. So this was, there was a lot of personal agency and decisions and so on. At the same time, you know, when I, when I interviewed people, people like to stress personal agency. That's how we like to think that we are, we are, we are um, you know, we determine our own fate. And people would, for example, when people were released from the special settlements in the gulags, we know that they went to Central Asia. When I interviewed people, they would say to me, you know, yeah, my dad wanted to go there because I had asthma, and um, they, he wanted to take care of me to go to a dry place. Then when I was in Soviet Union, in Russia, I realized, no, it was another deportation. It was the Soviet Union. You couldn't just say, hey, I'm going to go do wherever. I mean, you got to... A deportation card, that deportation card said you have to go to this and this location, location in it was Samarkand to stay with this and this Uzbeki person who had to accept you. So it was uh, a, a mix, but I think definitely there was, there was some agency, including the decision whether to send the children to Iran or not. So Jewish children were evacuated to Iran for the most part without their parents. And that was a decision that my grandparents made to save the children even if they die. Some people said, and I met those people in Israel who said, whatever will be our fate will be our children's fate. And they didn't send them. The children ended up in Uzbekistan and you know, took a different path. Which is one of the many other parallels to the fate uh, under the direct German occupation. Uh, I would like to now maybe uh, ask for questions and comments. It, should, should you wait for the microphone? I don't mind, I've got the 3,000 in empty head. Um, <laughs> one of the places where you indicated you wanted to oh. stop was Yemen, which is one of my favorite countries I've been there three times. And unfortunately, you gave the hint that you didn't speak too much. So I, as I asked you, did you ever say anything about your sojourn in Yemen and was it in Yemen or Yeah, actually, you're right. It was in Aden, so is that um, there is he did. I mean, they were only in Aden for like three days, 
but uh, I have a very, actually there was a very moving anecdote from Aiden, because when they get, so the children are basically, so as you can see, so they're in Iran. So the children are evac these children are evacuated from uh, Turkmenistan to Iran, and then in order to be evacuated to to Palestine, they have to. I mean, first you can see that the distance is actually very close, right? I mean, it's actually if you to go from from uh, Tehran to Tel Aviv, it's I think 48 hour ride, or I don't know something like that, maybe a little bit more, but. Of course, these, not of course, but these children could not go, go through Iraq. Why couldn't they go through Iraq? Because Iraq would not let Jewish children go to Palestine in 1943 in, when already the, the Jewish-Arab conflict in, in, uh, in Palestine is at its, at its height. In fact, Eleanor Roosevelt writes the prime minister of Iraq and tells her, please, this is a humanita humanitarian uh, case. These are children. And he says, no, I'm very sorry. If it's a humanitarian case, it will keep them in Iraq. And you can pay for them to be here. So they end up going on British warships. And they're going, so on the British warships, extremely dangerous journey. The Indian Ocean is full of, of German sea mines. And they, they stop in Aden. When they get to Aden, they're told, you have to hide in the deck because you know, these are Arabs, and they'll see you, and they'll know that you're Jewish children on the way to Palestine, and, you know, you'll get in trouble. Because the minute they stop, the children, their children, they all go in the dock, and the local children all jump in the water and surrounding them, surrounding them, and the, ch the local children are screaming at them and saying, food, food, food. Now, these children have been through extreme starvation, extreme starvation for three years. But on this ship, they have tons of food. It's a British warship. So the children go down to the kitchen, and they start bringing out food and throwing it to the children who are like diving into the water to get this food. And I have uh, one diary, and one child writes, it's the first time we saw children that seemed worse off than us. Um, so. That's that's the that's the anecdote I have from Aiden. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I haven't read your book yet. I'm looking forward to it. How many children were on that group that your dad was able to? Your dad and I guess your aunt was able to get out. It's it's, it's a near nearly one thousand nine hundred something and, in this group. And who? Which which agencies like the joint or does anybody help with that? Absolutely, and my story is very much, you said it, but it's, it's so many things. And um, I mean, part because it is the first book of its kind, I just felt I had to include everything in it, including this question of aid. The Joint Distribution Committee, which is a Jewish aid organization, was instrumental in helping these refugees. Um, the Joint, from the beginning of the war, is trying to, to help Jews who are in Europe, of course, they can't help the people who are stranded in Nazi-occupied Europe very much. Then they say, here we, we have these people. We have these thousands of people which we can actually help. The Joint helps. The Jewish Agency of Palestine also helps. The Jewish Agency of Palestine comes to Iran and to, to help these kids. And moreover, not only to help these kids, but to try to help the refugees who are stranded in, so in the Central Asia. If you see, let me see if I get this is this by the way is the camp the tent camp in Iran that these children are in. This is uh, the tent camp is in part of a Polish refugee camp which is inside an Iranian Air Force base, a former Iranian Air Force base. And I want to show you. So this this is um, the, the um, packages that are being shipped from Iran to, into Soviet Central Asia. So basically, once the joint and the Jewish agency come to Iran, even after these, uh, these refugees leave, they don't leave. They actually use Iran as a base for where to send aid to the refugees. So yes, they're absolutely helped and aided by inter the joint, especially international Jewish organizations, and the Jewish Agency of Palestine, which really, um, in trying to get to the refugees who are in the Soviet Central Asia, 
they try to cross the border and people get killed. People get killed. They try to, they try to cross the border from Iran to Turkmenistan. The Soviets shoot them. They try again. The Soviets shoot them again. So there, is, there are real sacrifices, both financial and in life, made to help these refugees. But also Persian Jews. And Pers right? Yeah, 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 that's right. So first of all, there are wonderful stories about Persians who see these children. Of course, the Persian population doesn't know that these refugees are coming. They just kind of land there one day. And people very spontaneously who see these refugees that look awful, they're in rags, and people just see them, they start crying. They, there's testimonies of one man who um, just buys the entire contents of a candy stall and brings these children candy and, and other things. So these are regular Persians, not necessarily Jewish Persians. Um, afterwards, once the children are organized in a, this Jewish camp, per, the Persian Jewish community organizes as well, together with other Jewish refugees who are there to, to help them. They collect money, they collect clothing, they uh, invite them, they take them, believe it or not, they take them to see the great dictator in a, in a, in a movie house in Tehran. Um, so, uh, and then they take them to the synagogue in Yom Kippur and so on. So, um, yes, they get helped from Jews and some non-Jews around the world. Thank you. I can relate very well to what you said earlier. Uh, my mother uh, was also in, uh, well, she was from Yashi in Romania, uh, also not an official survivor, and I, I actually went with her a few uh, years ago and experienced what you first did when you went to Poland. It seemed like, you know, a magical place, all those names, and, you know, and uh, it came to life. My question is about the Deputy Minister of Culture. Uh, are you still in touch, and have you asked, or has, I don't know if it's a he or she, offered to, um, you know, say anything publicly about your book? <laughs> yes, we're still in touch. Uh, um, I mean, we hadn't been in touch in a long time, but she, she's my Facebook friend, you know, social media, so, um, and she has been following the book. Um, in fact, I was just telling Natalia that she, a few days ago, she, off, she wrote me and she offered, she said, would you like this book to come out um, by the publishing house of the Polish ministry, with the Polish Ministry of Culture? And I said, you know, I really think you should read it first. Before <laughs> you offer that. It's a vote of trust. <laughs> uh, right, it's a vote of trust. I mean, you know, I think, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm actually, I'm, I'm very nervous. I didn't know exactly what to do because um, she entertained me. Even if you read the book, you'll see there's a whole chapter. She entertained me. She helped me in my research a lot. In, in some ways, she, 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 she seduced me. And not, you know, not seduced me, not romantically, but uh, she seduced me with uh, this, this Polish narrative until the archives showed me that I've been seduced. Um, but... Um, you know, it remains to be seen what happens with the book and Poland. It hasn't been taken by any, or bought by any Polish publisher yet. She, they will read it. I mean, Natalia can maybe assess the situation better, better than I can, um, whether they'll read it and accept it. I did make, I mean, all my Polish friends, especially Polish friends who are on the left, tell me I was very gentle with her. Um, because I did try to acknowledge, I mean, she, the fact that she helped me and so on. Whatever I wrote, I documented very, very carefully because I didn't want a lawsuit on my hand. Um, so I'm not sure. At the same time, I think she'll be very disappointed to read that my book is not going to be a story of friendship between, or, or a big story of friendship between Christians and Jewish Poles. There was a lot in Iran, especially Polish nationalism was rampant and, um, but also in, before that, and, um, and uh, so the story is complicated. At the same time, what I will say about, what, one of the interesting things about Christian Poles is that they, the Christian Poles in Iran end up in Palestine, right? So while the Jewish Poles, most of them are, remain in Soviet Central Asia, 
the Christian Poles continue on, many of them, from Iran to Palestine. And in Palestine, they go to Hebrew University, they study in schools. They have a they, cabaret. They have a cabaret. They have, uh, there are like 200 memoirs written by Poles in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. And, uh, you know, I, I interviewed a woman, a Polish woman who, who was in Palestine in, 19, in, in 1940s. She now lives in Denver. She said, those were the best years of my life. Um, so the tensions between Christians and Poles in Palestine subsides considerably considerably. I mean, there are some tensions, but it's much better than before. Oh, and we can, I think you can guess why. I don't anticipate the publication by the Polish Ministry of Culture, by the way. <laughs> I don't think so, but hopefully not a loose lawsuit either. Yes, but I, what I'd like to ask you is, you know, everybody knows about the book Exodus. Remember, that was a, a, a best-selling book. They made a movie out of it, and that was about Jews coming, Jews coming from Europe into into Palestine directly, and I think they stopped in Cyprus. But you know, when you're you're covering a topic not everybody knows about. Why is it has it taken so long for you for, for this for the story of your family to come out as it has when everybody knows the other side of it? You know, I'm just wondering. It's taken a long time. Better late than never. I think so. I, mean, I don't know why the, why it's, why it hasn't been. Um, why? I mean, I, the Tehran children's story, the truth is that it's very, it is very well known in Israel. But what is known, is, in a sense, is only the last leg. It's only their sort of rescue into, into Palestine. And there, of course, um, I showed you, oh, I, was, I went through. Sorry. This is the children arriving in Palestine on February 19, 1943. You can see the entire population was, uh, was out. Children were dismissed from school. Children stood on both sides of the train tracks and screamed at them. These, they were really the first, first group of refugees to arrive as a group in to Palestine in the middle of the war. And people went nuts. People didn't really exactly know what was happening in Europe and so on. Um, so. Um, so the story is very well known, but I, it's very well known. It, it, you know, in a way, it's thought about from the end to beginning, right? From their, their rescue and so on, and the happy, ever, in a way, the happy ending. I wrote this story from the beginning to the end. So I started tracing them from pre war Poland through all these stations, and that's less known. What happened in Tehran is, is, not, is much less known. I didn't really know that. You know, I didn't even, they were called Tehran children, but I didn't understand that they lived in Tehran, that they went to see the great dictator in Tehran, that they were, they were entertained, they were, that they met, uh, that they went to synagogue in Tehran, met Persian Jews for the first time, and, and all that happens. So each one of these places has its own history. That, that was unknown. I, I think if I may add to this, there is, uh, there is also a question to, that Michal alluded to before, spoke about before, that there are pieces that belong to different national stories, no? different national uh, narratives. So the story of deportations and the hunger in Central Asia, there is a flood of literature, but it hasn't been until very recently discussed in the context of Jewish survival, etc., etc., etc. So, so in a way, it's bringing these pieces together, which makes that story. Um, that, that's special. right. Well, in a way, that's a yeah. yeah. Well, that's a post-war story. Yeah, but that, you're absolutely right. It's exactly that. I mean, this is a transnational story. I mean, and although I'm a, I am a scholar of comparative literature. But it's very hard to think in these ways, because you're absolutely right. The story of deportations belongs to the Russians, right? And not only that, but um, those archives were not even available until very recently. The, the story of Israel or Palestine belongs to the Israelis. And so Zionist activists. Zionist activists. And so, so I, and the archives that I worked with in to find these these materials are so different. And each one, each piece exists in completely different archive. For example, those um, basically the me clandestine members of the Zionist 
uh, of the Jewish agency who were working to help bring these children to Palestine. They were in Iran. They were from Kibbutzim. They were part of an organization called Mossad Laliyah Bet, which is actually the, the pre-Mossad Mossad that we know. All their materials are in kibbutz archives. They're not in Yad Vashem. They're not in other archives. So, and, you know, you, you need goes, to know. You need, you need to know. To know, where know. To go. You need to know, and it takes a long time to know what you even need to know. Um, so yes, it's a it's a it's a transnational story, and you need to get into that mindset in order to put it together. Um, touched on this regarding Iran, but on the Soviet part. Um, in Central Asia, was there any contact between these refugees and, say, the Bukharan community or any of the, of the local Jews in Central Asia, number one? And number two, was there even at some point a cynical suggestion that these people be sent to Birobidjan, the Jewish autonomous oblast in the Soviet Far East? Yeah, that's a great. I don't, uh, to, the, to the second part of your question, I, I, I don't know. Um, and maybe somebody else knows, but I, 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 I haven't heard anything. They did have contact with Bukharan Jews. I was in Bukhara, and uh, they are remembered, and uh, people, well, everywhere you go, people say, oh, we, we took care of them, and so on. The Bukharan Jewish community was very, very, by, by 1940s, was very poor, because, of course, all the wealthy Bukharan Jews had already been exiled or left by the Soviets. Uh, they did have contacts, they did um, worship together, they did help them to an extent. They also had contact with non-Jews. Um, one of the most uh, moving moments on this journey, maybe the most moving moments, was that I was able to, um, to get to the exact village that my family was sort of ended up in, and there were Uzbek farmers living there and they said to me, you know, we remember the refugees, we remember, we pray for them and we remember how they came and they were so hungry that they, they ate live frogs. Uh, and, um, and they, you know, they welcomed me. It was, it was, it was really moving and, and so they had, they were in these settlements with Uzbeks, with Tajiks, with Kazakhs uh, and their experiences were variable in some ways. Um, and, and they were variable because of a lot of reasons. Uh, more, for example, more people survived in Kazakhstan than in Uzbekistan, I believe, because the Kazakhs were nomads, and in a way, I think they were not as loyal to the Soviet government. They were better at hiding food. They were maybe identified with the refugees more, and so on. So, um, so yes, they, they were. To, it, but they were there for years. I mean, they were there um, for the duration of the war. Many of them, of course, remained in those areas, and they became Soviet citizens. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, came with Aliyah. They came. They came. Yeah. I mean, this. This. Oh, sorry. This woman, right here, is a woman I interviewed in Samarkand. She was a Polish Jew. She came to with everybody to. She ended up in Samarkand, but she didn't continue anywhere. She married an Uzbek man. She, she still lives in Samarkand, and um, I interviewed her. She was sitting in this sort of, there was this interior courtroom, there was a sewage running, uh, and, um, in, and I said to her, well, how would you summarize your life? And she said, you know, it was, it was a good life. It started out very badly, but I met this nice man, and I was there, and so on. So, um, so you know, some people stayed, some people, um, in 1942, the Soviet government had an explicit policy of encouraging locals to adopt children of multi, multiple Soviet nationalities in order to strengthen the Soviet state. So this is, uh, there was a, an Uzbek um, blacksmith who adopted 10 children. You can see these children are, uh, so Korean, Koreans who were also exiled, Jewish, Polish, um, and he was hailed as a great patriot. There was, uh, he was written about in Pravda and so on. So these children who were adopted, then they became Uzbeks, right? Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the Soviets deported Jews who were living in Poland. Uh, what was the reason given, or what was, you know, was it really considered anti-communist anti or small bit bourgeois? What was the reason? Um, the, 
the people who were deported for various reasons. The reason my family and most fam Jewish families were deported is, and, it's, and this is a story I did hear from my father, more or less, was that, um, so they, they fled to the Soviet border. I mean, we, if, we, if we go back to, sorry, so this map here, this is occupied Poland. This is the Soviet side. This is the German side. War says of the Soviet side, Bialystok on the, on, the, on the Soviet side. In the first weeks of the war, a million and a half Polish Jews end up on this side, whether they fled here, like my family, or they just lived here and they fell under Soviet occupation. So they are deported, my family, for example, because they, after about six months of being in a total refugee crisis in the Soviet Union, they decide, we're just going to go back to the German side. Your grandfather decided. My grandfather decided. But this was, again, it was presented to me as this crazy decision, but tens of hundreds of thousands of pe people decided exactly the same thing. There were, they said, you know, things are horrible in the Soviet Union. I mean, they were also anti-communist, and they were bourgeois, and they, had, they, had, they owned a, a brewery and so on. But that was not, I mean, the reason was the situation was very bad. They had already lived through a German occupation in World War I. They survived it. They said, well, we'll go back to the German side. Uh, when they professed that they registered to go back to the German side, after a few weeks, NKVD, Soviet Social Secret Police men would show up. Um, they would be said, OK, we, you're going to be taken to, um, to these trains. They were boarded up on these, on these trains. And their trains, rather than going west, went east. And they were deported. So people would be deported uh, to this. They were deported into the Soviet interior. And very, very difficult. These deportations were almost like deportations to death camps. And they were deported for weeks without food, without with very little water. Um, but having said that, I now know, because I research in those archives, a lot of it simply decided, you know, this was the Soviet Union. They decided that they need slave laborers because they need to build a railroad in Komi or in Arkhangelsk, and enough people would be arrested to be deported to cut the trees to build that railroad. And a lot of it began that way and not the other way around. I had a close friend who uh, the family uh, escaped Poland, and they went into uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, throughout most of the uh, of the war, the occupation by the, you know as the uh, Germans went deeper, they kept uh, m maybe more than she the way she described it. She, they kept a few miles ahead of them, and by the uh, towards the end, they were only a few miles from uh, from Iran, but they stopped. And then they worked themselves back to, to Poland. But I'm a little confused about your, your family. They left, they all left together, right? The, your your uh, grandparents and uh, your father and uh, his sister. And how did they subsist in, um, in both uh, Central Asia, which they eventually got to, and also uh, in Iran? How, just the day-to-day -day, uh, existence. Yeah, so let's go back to the map for a second. So they flee, they flee together. Yeah, that's right. Um, they flee together. They end up um, here, Semyatice, which is to the south of Bialystok and where they had family. They're deported to Akhangelsk together. In Akhangelsk, they they, they, they're, they're slave laborers, including my father, because children over 13 work. They get some kind of a ration. Most of the, the way that they survive is because they, so actually, let me backtrack. There's, they, they flee with other members of the family. They're a huge clan in, in uh, Ostrovozovich. They're actually one of two largest families in this town, larger than, than most Christian Poles. Some family members stay on the border, so they stay right here, and they're not deported. They are deported. The ones that are not deported, they supposedly did the smart thing and didn't say that they were going to go back to Germany, remain here, and they somehow, after a while, are kind of okay. They start working. They send these guys packages. They send them lard. 
They send them some stuff that helps them survive. When they have, it's, this is all about, this is all, it's, it's all about having something or having something to barter and so on. They also fled with things. They fled with uh, gold, they fled with, with some, some, some uh, valuables. When the Germans invade the Soviet Union in 1941, right? They, we, we, Germany invades the Soviet Union. These lucky ones, the ones that seemed lucky, the ones that were sending the, the packages, we know are killed, either murdered or ghettoized and later murdered in transports. These guys are released from the, from the settlements. So here, the, now they are free. These, they're no longer getting the packages. You know, I don't have the specifics of exactly how they survived the route. I know that they had some things that they, that they bartered with. This is a very good question because I know that they were not released without, they were released without, not, they were given nothing. They were given nothing at all. In fact, that's why many people actually, quite a few people decided they would stay there. People stayed, people would be released and somebody would say, hey, take a cow. And they would say, okay, we have a cow, we'll live here for the rest of the war. Um, in Central Asia, they do have some, there are some bread, they get, they get very, very little food. I mean, many, many people died in those years in Central, and there are a lot of very heartbreaking descriptions in children's testimonies. They describe, you know, my father was lying next to me, and then he just didn't get up. Um, at this point, American aid starts coming in, American, Jewish American, Polish Christian aid, um, later land lease um, aid, and so on, and they start, they, they, they survive. I mean, I mean it's the ones who survive, right? I think we have just for one more question. What time? Do we um, see this becomes an organized route? It seems, I mean, in, in one sense, I get the feeling that it's very haphazard, and on the other hand, it's, it's a refugee route. So when does organization take over, and by whom? Right, so they are, it, it really only becomes an organized route in Iran. And I, I guess you were asking how they survived in Iran. In Iran, or Iran is a neutral country. Iran is um, the first, I mean, Iran, I mean, there are shortages, but Iran is the first country that these children arrive at, that these refugees arrive at, that is not ravaged by war. And there are these wonderful, wonderful testimonies, um, including from this diary that I was telling you about, about just kind of, my God, you know, it's so beautiful, and people are looking, are, are nice, and we, there is bread, and there are no lines, and so on. Um, so in Iran, they are, first of all, there is food. Second of all, they're very, the, the children are very quickly organized by, basically, Zionist organization, by, by Zionists who come from, either from Palestine, or some of them who came with the refugees, and so they're organized into a kind of Jewish Zionist camp. Not all of them. So some of them remain in part of, part of the larger Polish camp. Some of them are, a few of them I think are adopted by Iranian Jewish families and so on. But in Iran there is already, um, they're under the care of the British government. They're under the care of, um, there is actually a Persian official who is in charge of the refugees and, and uh, it's more, it becomes more organized and, re they rem and it remains organized all the way to Palestine. In Palestine there is Henrietta Sold who is uh, the head of uh, the Jewish women's organization Hadassah is in charge of them and she places them and so on. So it, but it be does become organized only in Iran. Um, I'm looking nervously at the, at the clock. I think, uh, let me ask you one last question and maybe we can then continue over um, mineral water uh, at the... <laughs> no, wine, wine. I'm told there's wine. Wait, I, <laughs> I was hopeful. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, one of, I think I was gonna say, one of the most, I was gonna, one of the most, uh, the strangest things on this journey is that I ate so well, and you're writing about people who are starving, and of course, everywhere you go, people are inviting you for meals, and Uzbekistan, and so, yeah. So I, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about this historiographical moment uh, uh, in uh, authors like you writing deeply per personal but research stories, and I'm thinking of, obviously, Daniel Mendelssohn, uh, Lost, and The Seven, um, Ellen Friedman and um, 
um, and others. Uh, what do you think? What is happening that um, second generation, um, direct second generation or kind of imagined people who think of themselves as part of families that had various wartime experiences need to explore that past now? Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly a phenomenon. I can't say, I've been thinking about that. I, I don't have a good theory yet for that. Um, although I do see that we, a lot of us are moving to much more kind of serious historical research rather than kind of, I mean, if we think about Art Spiegelman and Maus, which is such a kind of an important text, second generation text. If you people know it, it's, it's a graphic novel and he draws himself as this little child who is overwhelmed by this history. I feel like we've grown. I don't feel like a little child anymore. I feel like I can face this history, which is very, very horrible, but I have the tools to face it. And I don't know if it's a, it's a question of uh, enough time has passed. Um, I certainly, uh, you know, I wrote a book, English is not my first language. I wrote a book in English. So in, not in my own language, not in my own discipline per se, because I'm not a historian, I'm a literary critic. Um, and, but I think that distance also helped. Um, I definitely think that people like my father had, you know, the, he, my father worked six days a week. He just to kind of trying to, to in a way make up for what he had lost and to give us a better future and so on. Um, I, he didn't have the, the time, the education, the means to, to understand his own experience in a way. And I think, you know, I do. And Daniel Mendelssohn does. And, um, I, I think I bring, um, I mean, a lot of us that you write are working outside our discipline, so that's also something interesting. But I think I bring, I am kind of a reader of text. I read testimonies. When I read skeptically. I mean, if somebody tells me, tells me, you know, I always help the Jews. I, you know, I immediately kind of like, really? Um, <laughs> so uh, I can read kind of a little bit um, across the, the grain. And I think Edmund Deval, you know, looks at objects. Um, so I, I think we're going to see more and more of these works in a way that give historical answers to psychological questions, I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you.